हरे कृष्णा प्रभु यू कैन हियर मी नो प्रॉब्लम आई गॉट अ साउंड सिस्टम अपस्टेज डू यू वॉन्ट इट और इट्स ओके यू कैन हियर मी फाइन कमेंट so thank you for coming today evening i'm sorry there's a little bit of uh, back and forth about the exact timings so i'll speak this in three main parts i'll speak about about how sunas radhanath maharaj is is fulfilling the dream of vision of shri prabhupad through both his submission and his own inspiration and then from that i'll draw some lessons about how we can serve our spiritual master and grow in our bhakti and lastly i'll talk about some thoughts on guru tatva as it unfolds in our life so how many of you have been to yeah Yeah okay sure mm-hmm. So how many of you have been to Govardhan Eco Village Okay now the some of you Okay So Govardhan Eco Village is uh, is the project on which Sri Radhanath Maharaj has spent a huge amount of energy in the last few years Now even when he's in India, most of the time he's not at Radha Gopinath Temple. He spends more time in Govardhan Eco Village than in the temple also. And um, basically, if we look at what uh, Maharaj has done over there, he has uh, when Shri Prabhupada was in America, he basically wanted a, a replica of Vrindavan in the West. because that was what the new vindavan project was meant to be and the idea was that actually so we can get my bag laptop bag the sound system is there we could use that It'd be easier so the idea was that people from the west may not come all the way to india to vindavan and here there is a whole experiential aspect to bhakti which cannot be overlooked it is not just about there is some some experience of bhakti we get in kirtan in darshan but coming to a place just centered on krishna that has its own charm of course prabhupad wanted devotees to come to rindavan in mayapur but he knew new people may not come not even all devotees would be able to come so he wanted a place for pilgrimage in the west and that's what he wanted new rindavan to be but for various reasons it didn't work out so then in some ways that same purpose maharaj is serving by the govardhan eco village so if you ever go to india it's eminently worth it to go and see there is the replica of all the seven temples that have been there that are there in rindavan and now most famously Yes, now there's the Radha Madan Mohan Temple, which is actually the same dimensions as the original Radha Madan Mohan Temple. And the pujari who had Maharaj when the temple was inaugurated, Radha Maharaj invited the pujari from the Radha Madan Mohan Temple, the priest over there, as well as the Radha Madan Mohan deities are in Karoli. And there in Karoli, the pujari was also invited. so those priests said that radhanath maharaj has after 500 years reunited madan mohan with his temple <laughs> so <coughs> now if you even see the picture it's magnificent it towers above the whole landscape there are small small replicas of the other temples but there's a magnificent replica of the madan mohan temple full size and thousands and thousands of, of even western devotees have come over the years there to to experience to experience india and many of them they the first trip to india 
So one idea is that actually we want a replica. That was Prabhupada's vision that we need to have a, a replica <coughs> of Vrindavan. So it couldn't be in America. It was in India. So now Maharaja did some things for Western people also. So and I was in Vrinda when I had been in Gorakhani College. I asked Maharaj this question. Maharaj, you know, what was your inspiration or vision behind starting this? So that morning, uh, I had given the Bhagavatam class. And somehow, Maharaj came and sat in the class. <laughs> so I became quite nervous. Earlier, Maharaj has heard my, Maharaj has many Bhagavatam classes in Radha Gopinath temple, but he is from his room. He didn't come and sit in here, but he heard the class. And then after that, when I was speaking, when I speak, that, that afternoon I was speaking with Maharaj, He's telling about my Western outreach and he was asking various things, how things are going. So then I asked him about this, about uh, the, the vision for the Gaurdhani College. So he said that you know, every phase in history has its own, own stress or its own flow. And we need to tap its flow. So when Prabhupada went to America, there were the hippies. They had a, the flow was counterculture. And when Prabhupada gave them a completely different culture of living, Prabhupada tapped into that and he was phenomenally successful. When Prabhupada came back to India, at that time, actually we were not that successful in terms of recruiting people to become full-time devotees. There are very few people, Indians who became Prabhupada disciples in India at that time. Because the India, the mood was of cultural nationalism. And... We just become liberated after, from foreign rule after so many, not just the 120, 150 years or 200 years of the British rule, but before that, several hundreds of years of Islamic rule. So, there's a mood of cultural nationalism. And when Prabhupada brought in Western disciples who had become culturally Indian, not just spiritually or devotionally Indian, but culturally Indian, wearing dhoti kurtas and saris, it created a sensation. And Prabhupada used that to attract people. So the times were still not right when Prabhupada went in 65. Before, before 65 he had been trying a lot to preach but he was not very successful. When he came back in the 70s, he was successful but in a way different from what he was in America. In America, people became devotees and moved into the temples. That, did, that happened for very, very few people in India. But thousands and thousands of people became admirers, appreciators and supporters. So Prabhupada created the life membership program and Prabhupada built big temples. So he says, Maharaj said that now in many ways the mood in the world, especially the western world is of environmentalism. And so Govardhan Eco Village has the replica of New Vrindavan, but of Vrindavan basically. But that is not what is going to necessarily attract people because what do people know what is Krishna? <coughs> so what he has done is we have this whole eco-friendly project over there. And that's what draws people. So today the whole mood in the world is that not what, what you believe or what you practice, we don't care. The mood is, okay, whatever you believe and whatever you practice, how does it make a difference in this world? How does it make a difference to my life? How does it make a difference to the world, to my world? So if you can demonstrate that practically to people, then people are ready to follow. So there is an otherworldly aspect to spirituality and there is this worldly aspect. So people in general are not concerned that much with the otherworldly aspect. Of course that is important, but we can't expect them to suddenly develop concern for that. They are concerned about this worldly aspect. So if we can show in this world how we can create a better planet, at least help to create a better planet, how we can help deal with issues in this world by the practice of bhakti, then that will attract people. So, <clears throat> so why I said Maharaj heard my Bhagavatam class that day, that Maharaj said that, you know, so I observed this and he said that <coughs> Chaitanya Charan, I am not a very organized person. I am spontaneous. And he said, of course, it's a, I, had given, I had spoken in my class, okay, I, th I think it's I spoke, it's it discharged. Let it be. Attach it, to the laptop to... it won't work like that. It has a. It doesn't have multitasking capacity. <laughs> if it's charging, it's not speaking. Do you need battery 
phrase you are probably. No idea. That's okay, you can hear me, no? Yes. Yes. No need. So so then in my class I had spoken in the morning about how we have impulses and we have instincts. Now, impulses are usually anti-intelligent, yes, to eat too much, to sleep too much, to surf too much, whatever, we have impulses. But instincts are like programmed intelligence. So some people just come to a room and ask, you know, okay, you put this painting here, you put this, make, put, get a curtain like this, you put this sofa here, it will look beautiful. Somebody might be staying in that room for six months and they will not think about it. <laughs> so that's instinct. They just know how to do it. As some people have instinct for music, some people have an instinct for a language, like that. Some people have an instinct for decoration. So I said that instincts are what we need to channel and develop. And impulses are something which um, we have to restrain. So then Maharaj, he said, I, I am spontaneous, but I said, I hope I am not impulsive, I am instinctive. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said that, but, now the Zunavi became a very serious point, he said, but my instincts have been shaped by my 40, by my almost 50, for 50 years of chanting Hare Krishna every day. Of almost my 50, 10 years of DT worship, several times every day. Of my 20, 30 years of congregation preaching, community building. And before that, all my journey home experiences. So he says, based on these instincts, uh, I have, I saw this need and this is how we developed it. So here, <coughs> it, has, it has, now it has, it has been able to do a lot of, it has been able to reach a lot of people who are not being reached in the Western world as well as in India. India also, many corporates come over there for a retreat and then, they have their own corporate training and then they have some spiritual training also. So a lot of people whom we had not reached earlier were, are being reached over there. And of course we have the uh, f farming going on, we have the community development going on, lots of things are happening. So here, uh, the theme which I am going to draw from this is that when we want to connect with our spiritual master, we want to serve our spiritual master, we want to develop a connection with our spiritual master basically, there is one thing that a spiritual master has a vision, has a desire, has an aspiration, and we try to fulfill that. And that is what uh, uh, Maharaj wanted to do when he did the Govardhani village. But it's not only that, because we all have been given our intelligence and we have our own individuality, and we have to use it in the service of Krishna. So when Maharaj made the, initially when they wanted to make the New Vrindavan, they wanted to make it completely f free from electricity or anything of modern technology. And they tried it for a long time and it didn't work much. So when they made Govardhan Ecology, Maharaj said, we want this to be natural and comfortable. Not natural and austere. Natural and comfortable. The idea is that, this is where if people want to come, we don't want to make people's coming to Krishna more difficult than what it needs to be. There's any way difficulty is there, but you don't want it to be more difficult than what it needs to be. And for that purpose, so, so the, you could say the vision for that is from Srila Prabhupada. But along with that, it is also from his own experience, from his own inspiration. So Maharaj said that when he came to, of course there are multiple reasons for this, but he said when he came to Rindavan, the first thing he saw was the Madan Mohan temple. So Madan Mohan that captured his heart and <coughs> Padad Mohan is Jayatam Surato Pangor Mamandam Tergati Matsarva Supadam Boja Radha Madan Mohan So <coughs> this is the deity So you want people to be attracted to Krishna So Madan Mohan is the deity That's why the, among all the temples Madan Mohan is a special large temple over there And <coughs> when we are trying to serve our spiritual master or in general grow in bhakti there is the aspect of submission and there is the aspect of taking, of finding our own inspiration and serving. So, Maharaj had some association of Srila Prabhupada personally, but not much. But simultaneously, however, he had of course association through the Vani, always. So, the way the movement has spread now, 
<coughs> I was with one devotee in the Muravilamba farm and he is from another part of the world, he's from Europe and then he was in UK, then he went, he's from UK, he went to Ireland, he came back to Scotland, he was traveling to various places. So once he asked Maharaj, Maharaj, should I go here or should I be here? Maharaj said that whatever you, Maharaj said three things to him. He said, be Krishna conscious, be happy and cooperate with the local authorities. So I was thinking about this, that this is a principle that we can apply in our lives. That be Krishna conscious. Wherever we are, ultimately, we are connecting with the spiritual master and Srila Prabhupada to be Krishna conscious. So our particular services, our jobs, our family obligations may take us to various places. Some places we may have a lot of association. Some places we may have less association. But it is for us to be Krishna conscious. And Krishna consciousness is not meant to be simply an austerity. We want to be happy in Krishna consciousness. In fact, one of the main reasons why he started the counselor system was to have, you could say, lateral support. There's a vertical support from the spiritual master. But along with that, there's a lateral support also. Now that can come in various forms through the devotee care system or whatever, in different parts. But the idea is that uh, one of the main purposes of the counselor system was that devotees should feel inspired to keep practicing bhakti throughout their life. They feel connected, they feel supported. And so we all have to find out what are the things that we can happily do in Krishna consciousness. Sometimes we may have to do some austerities also. Mm-hmm. But sometimes we also have to, but we also need to overall look at what can we do steadily and happily in Krishna consciousness. So once I was at a program and we are talking about while practicing bhakti, there are many things we have to tolerate. So I asked, what all do we have to tolerate? So one devotee raised hand enthusiastically. He says, yes, he says, we have to tolerate devotees. <laughs> <laughs> So I said yes, <laughs> that's a good realization <laughs> that no, we have to tolerate devotees, we shouldn't just give up because some, we find some devotees troublesome or whatever. But if as we mature further, as we advance further, we will also realize that devotees are tolerating us, <laughs> that it works the other way also. So within devotee association, there will be some devotees association who will inspire us, some devotee association may not inspire us so much. So, we have to take the responsibility for staying happy. See, this is be Krishna conscious and be happy. This is actually a rephrasing of Srila Prabhupada's instruction, chant Hare Krishna and be happy. Now, the interesting analysis of chant Hare Krishna and be happy. Is this one instruction or two instructions? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Two <laughs> weeks. <laughs> two will become one. One two Yeah, after some time two should become one. Yes, actually there's a nice verse, 1.2.22 in the Bhagavatam, which says, Atogai kavayo nityam bhaktim paramaya muda vasudeve bhagwati kurvanti atma prasadanim. So therefore the great sages, with great joy, Atogai kavayo nityam Bhaktim Paramaya Muda, with great joy, they practice Bhakti. Kurvanti Atma Prasadinim, they practice with Atma Prasadinim means that which gives great joy to the soul. So they practice with great joy, the process that gives great joy to the soul. So what does this mean? One example to understand this could be that say, if somebody has been sick for a long time, and finally they have found a medicine that works. But because their sickness has been chronic for a long time, the cure is also going to take some time. So although they are not happy in the sense of that they are cured, but they are happy because they have found a cure. So, and they can be happy that I am on the path to recovery. So there is a happiness to be cured and there is also a happiness to be on the path to be cured. So therefore, if we consider it this way, that Krishna Consciousness is something which will cure us. 
So sukham kartum avyam. It will make us, as we connect with Krishna, it will give us eternal happiness eventually. But till then, because we are the part of the material world, sometimes ups and downs will be there. So we need to be happy. That means chant Hare Krishna and be happy. You can see them as two parallel instructions, which will eventually become causal. The chanting Hare Krishna will itself lead to happiness. But right now we can see it as parallel. So similarly, be Krishna conscious and be happy. And <clears throat> being happy is not in a not in a narcissistic sense that I'll do whatever I want to be happy, I don't care for others. But within the purview of devotional activities, we try to be happy. And one way, <coughs> one very valuable way to be happy is by, by being grateful. Now, generally, if we look at dissatisfaction, in every situation in our life, there are some things which we have and some things that we don't have. So, this is yesterday I wrote, I worked on a Gita Daily article. I write these articles on the Gita every day. So, to be happy is possible, but to be happier than others is impossible. <laughs> Why is it impossible? Because respect somebody is good or not. Like, we'll never be satisfied with the, what we have. Yeah, two reasons. That's true. One is, that we imagine others to be happier than they are. <laughs> and secondly, we equate happiness with certain things. And there will always be people who have those things more than us. So to be happy is possible. But to be happier than others is impossible. So now to be happy means in whatever situation we are in, we look at the things that we have. Not at the looks, look at the things that we don't have. Look at the things that are right in our life. Look at the things, not at that, the things that are not right in our life. So, even in Krishna consciousness this applies. In Krishna consciousness also, we might feel that I need certain, certain kind of association, certain kind of facilities, certain kind of devotees, certain kind of services. And if I get that, I'll be happy. But if I don't get that, so I'm unhappy. But even in Krishna consciousness, if you understand that now we are in Krishna's inner circle. Ultimately, Krishna cares for everyone. But ye thamam prapadyante, that means as all people surrender to me, I reward accordingly. What that means is that Krishna, that the circles are like concentric. And those who are more surrendered, they are in more and more inner circle of Krishna. Everybody is in Krishna's circle, but everybody is in circles of different radii. So, when we are practicing Krishna Consciousness, when we are committed to the practice of Krishna Consciousness, that means we have come into a significant inner circle. And when you come in that circle, that means what we need for Krishna Consciousness, uh, Krishna knows it better than us. So, not just in our material life, but even for our Krishna Consciousness, what we need, Krishna will provide us. So one thing that may make us dissatisfied in our Krishna consciousness is that we don't get association of our spiritual master. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, as a devotee, as a, as a disciple or aspiring disciple, we naturally aspire for the association. But at the same time, we also understand that it is Krishna with whom we are connecting and Krishna knows our need and Krishna will fulfill that need in some way or the other for us. So that means that, in, of course, there is an aspect that we always want more association of the spiritual master, more association of like-minded devotees. So Prabhupada summarizes this dynamic very nicely. A devotee desires the darshan of Krishna, but doesn't demand the darshan of Krishna. So we desire, but we don't demand. So we desire naturally for, we all would desire more association of the spiritual master, more association, more personal time or whatever, but we don't demand it. We understand that whatever I need for my spiritual growth, Krishna will provide me that. Of course, we seek for it according to our capacity, but we don't uh, demand it on particular terms. And that brings, not demanding it on particular terms, brings me third, third point. What are, what are the first two points? Being grateful. No, no. With respect to overall what Maharaj said, be. Happy. Happy. Be. Happy. And third. Cooperate with, cooperate with the local authorities. So now this is a important point to understand that 
वी आर अ पार्ट ऑफ अ बिग मूवमेंट बिग कम्युनिटी विच इज नाउ ऑल ओवर ग्लोबल सो ईच प्लेस विल हैव इट्स ओन लीडरशिप विथ इट्स ओन विजन ऑफ हाउ टू शेयर कृष्ण भक्ति एंड वंस महाराज इज आस्ट समटाइम्स विथ सम पीपल आर वेवल एंड रिजन मैच सो वॉट डू वी डू सो महाराज सर ह्यूमिलिटी मीन्स टू चेंज योर वेवल एंड सो दैट इट मैचेस नाउ वी मे नॉट बी एबल टू डू इट एंटायरली द प्रिंसिपल हियर इज दैट एज मच एज पॉसिबल इफ वी कैन वर्क कोऑपरेटिवली विद विथ द लोकल अथॉरिटीज then that indicates our service attitude not just towards maharaj but also towards the prabhupad because everybody is trying to serve shila prabhupad and if somebody wants to has some particular inspiration to do something in a particular way then that's also fine but we we may we, we can do it in a way that doesn't uh, that doesn't that doesn't come off as defiance to the local authority uh, see once two devotees had a very serious conflict and i was there uh, in maharaj's room at that time and they were talking so maharaj said that some people can get along with some people some people can't get along with some people so whatever happens he says don't spoil your relationship with devotees if you can't get along with someone keep a distance but don't spoil your relationship don't commit offenses so we all if you can find a service which we can do which can help us do all these three things you know, be krishna conscious be happy and satisfy the local authorities then we are immensely blessed and if you can find if you can find that there's nothing like it and we will find it gradually it's not necessary that a service is something suddenly one day we wake up and it's like a flash of lightning and we see the service we keep doing whatever services we are we get the opportunity to do and while they are doing that we also observe you know, what are the services that we feel happy doing what are the services we are able to do well and gradually we can gravitate toward that service so for us this point of and i was thinking of this desire but not demand so maharaj never demanded radha my spiritual master association but you know he took that instruction took his own inspiration and has uh, continued serving shri prabhupad and um, the broad movement across the world so same spirit we can have yes we want to Yeah, we want to serve our spiritual master but if we do this thing be krishna conscious be happy and cooperate with the authorities then we can flourish in our krishna consciousness and the last point i'll talk about is the guru tattva briefly this is a very complicated subject but i'll make two or two or two or three main points see uh, traditionally broadly there were two kinds of gurus one way the sanyasi gurus and the other way the grahastha gurus the sanyasi gurus were those who would just be basically like traveling monks and they would visit a particular place they would do some kirtan they would do some katha and people would feel very inspired by them and after that they would depart and maybe they would never come back to that place also now at least when we have sanyasi gurus we know their schedule we can plan our schedule and then we can say where can go and get association there at the time pass sadhya says there no plan no schedule no way to know anybody schedule also it's very difficult so if you see madhavendra puri he visited shantipur once and advaita acharya saw him over there advaita acharya was inspired and took initiation from madhavendra puri and there is no description that they ever met each other after that so when our advaita acharya flourished in no devotion and he became a leader of the vaishnava community over there so this is where the sanyasi basically use inspiration and departs and it is within the community that the that the disciple or the seeker continues one's bhakti the other were grahastha gurus the grahastha gurus were more like the priests of the local temples and they would be there for the marriage ceremony for the child's name giving ceremony for the various other ceremonies that are part of a normal life of samskaras and spiritual culture now they may or may not have been as advanced as the sanyasis sanyasis were always more respected because of their renunciation 
but this this priests were the people who were more available for everyone and uh, there was a there is a written tradition and there is a oral tradition if you see before what 300 400 years ago the printing press was invented in america in the in europe about 500 years ago 400 500 years ago. and then it came to india recently so prior to that most of the instruction was given through the oral tradition and every village would have some learned eld, learned pandits and they would speak krishna katha and that's how people would be nourished you know and if some traveling monks came mendicants came they would also speak so the idea was that there is a nourishment so of one kind of nourishment by the traveling sannyasis another by the local priests and people would flourish in their bhakti in both ways and whether somebody gets initiation from here or here it was not that important the important thing was that there was a whole community in which people advanced mr chetanya mahaprabhu also he met ishwar puri only twice first was in bodh gaya when he had gone to take uh, to do his uh, shraddha ceremony for his father and then later on he uh, actually once there and once in puri in mayapur itself when ishwar puri had come there so those two play times basically he and he took that inspiration that nourishment and continued his own bhakti now when shri prabhupad started his con it was a very unusual historically unprecedented situation you could say because prabhupad was a traveling sanyasi but there were no local priests and there was no local community in fact prabhupad installed jagannath because jagannath accidentally manifested there was sham sundar and prabhu and malati mataji they found jagannath at at a what do you call it uh antique shop or gift shop whatever not an antique shop but like a uh shop of uh, what is second hand items you know something like that so basically they found it and prabhupad was so please prabhupad offered away says he said let's install now after that jagannath is installed in one place another place by that time actually prabhupad had not yet published chaitanya charitamrita and you see in bhagavad gita there's no mention of jagannath hmm? so many devotee there's one one devotee who wrote a letter to prabhupad prabhupad we are worshiping the deities as per the rules that you told us but can you please tell us who are these deities <laughs> <laughs> so <coughs> prabhupad had to start things in a very uh, historically unprecedented way so he was a sanyasi but he has no support of a community no support of local priests also so he played all those roles now in order to play all those roles effectively prabhupad also in his talks and his books emphasized the the position of the spiritual master very heavily because in a sense he was the only authority of course he out delegated a lot of authority to his senior disciples who were also leaders but the principle was that the spiritual master is uh, a spiritual master is the guide so in prabhupad's books the core content is eternal but prabhupada is also speaking in a particular historical context so if we read prabhupada's books then we will feel that the, oh the spiritual master a we may feel not will we may feel sometimes that the spiritual master is the only source of spiritual advancement and yes that is true but the spiritual master is not just one person so the guru is a person and the guru is also tattva the tattva means that spiritual master is the guru is ultimately the principle that connects us with krishna the guru is a manifestation of balaram ji and therefore uh, prabhupada wrote a letter wrote a vyasapuja offering to his spiritual master and then he said there is one guru who manifests as many so prabhupada also told that there is diksha guru and there are shiksha gurus and among shiksha gurus there can be many and the shiksha gurus can also inspire us in multifarious ways so at a practical level even during prabhupada's times after the 1970s those devotees who came before the 70s they had a lot of association of prabhupada before but after the 1970s the movement had become too big and prabhupada wanted to focus on his writing although he would never could in an undistracted way but basically because of that he didn't have much um, time to associate with each of his disciples so that time also it was 
primarily through the shiksha gurus that most devotees got their shiksha, got their inspiration and they moved on. So today also we are now gradually moving towards from the extraordinary circumstances in which Prabhupada started the movement, we are slowly moving toward what was the tradition. <clears throat> what was the tradition? That there is a local community, there are local priests and there are devotees who are part of the local community. So we don't see in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's times, there, were, there, were, there might be a few renunciates. But most of the people there are the Grahastha community. But they are all well knit together in the practice of Bhakti. So that's something similar to what the situation we are currently in. And here, if you understand that there is one Guru Tattva, and that Guru Tattva manifests in various ways. And we can, that, that Krishna manifesting through the various Gurus, Shiksha and Diksha Gurus can draw us towards Him, can connect us towards Him. Uh, so here, this, what, is the, what is the importance of Diksha Guru then if Krishna can manifest in any different ways? I'll conclude with this example. <coughs> then we can have some questions. That <coughs> Suppose we enter into university. Now, now if say, somebody is entering into university uh, for some elite course, Somebody, somebody is doing a PhD or somebody is doing a course for very special people. Then, for special talented students, then, then the HOD or the Dean of the University may personally approve each admission. May evaluate, vet and approve each admission. After that, when the student is actually going to, say, do the PhD, the, with the approving authority, the Dean or the HOD may not be the person who is constantly working with that student. The student may have their own PhD guide. And most of what the student learns will be from the PhD guide. Now, of course, the PhD guide and the HOD both are working together only. They are working in the same department. But the student will learn from the primarily from the PhD guide. And that's how the student will grow. So similarly for us, when we enter into the Bhakti University, at that time, when entering into the Bhakti University, we are actually uh, a part of a whole tradition of learning. And in that tradition of learning, we are moving toward Krishna, so the spiritual master and the connection of the spiritual master and initiation by the spiritual master. All these are like the formal entry into the university. But along with that, the practical learning may happen through different Shiksha Gurus. So, say now this can happen in two different ways. One is that the university itself has a particular area in which they want research to be done. And then there is a particular faculty over there and they, they tell the student you work with this faculty and you do research in this area. The other is that the student has an interest in a particular area. And the student has interest in a particular area, then in that university there might be multiple faculties. And the student might go to a particular faculty who is also studied in that area, who is also a specialist in that area. And the student might work with them. And usually it is not usually it is neither entirely this nor that. You know, the, fact, the university has its own interests and the uh, and the research candidate also has their own interests and the two work together and find some medium. So similarly for us. Uh, our, our spiritual master is a Diksha Guru. And the spiritual master is the person who formalizes our entrance into the university. Now, of course, it's an open learning environment. So, we can continue learning even if there is no formal entry into the institution. Even if we accept the spiritual master in our heart, we are connected. And we can continue learning. But the stress here is that the, the learning process will happen the through the particular PhD guide with whom we are learning. So similarly, it will be through the particular Shiksha Gurus with whom we are working. So we don't want to uh, undermine the Diksha Guru, but we don't want to undermine the Shiksha Gurus also. Because ultimately, the point is not just to have the association of the spiritual master. The point is not just to spend time with the spiritual master. The point is 
to grow in knowledge and devotion for Krishna. Just like in a university, the point is not to spend time with the HOD. The point is not to take a selfie with the HOD and show the whole world. <laughs> the point is actually to study and do research and <clears throat> graduate. Similarly, our point is to be Krishna conscious. And so that can happen through various Shiksha Gurus also. And for that purpose, this whole idea of creating a community of uh, devotees who can support uh, the of creating Shiksha Gurus, that is what Maharaj has stressed in his training. Traditionally, when when ISKCON started, in the West, the main service was book distribution. In India, the main service was life membership. Of course, they are distributing books also, but it's mainly life membership. So then, and of course, later on, Prabhupada wanted to build temples, so it was fundraising. But when Maharaj got the charge of the Radha Gopinath community in the 1980s, late 1980s. So he said, or in the 1990s also, he said that we will, the Brahmachari is here, they will not do any fundraising. And they will not have, uh, they will not be involved too much in the temple management. They will not, for some years they decided, not in book distribution. So then many of the lead, Grahastha leaders, they thought, what are they going to do then? So Maharaj said, no. <coughs> they will study Shastra and then they will teach Shastra. So people were quite skeptical at that time. But Maharaj personally would take classes every day, sometimes two, three times a day. Your Bhagavatam class, your personal lecture, Chaitanya Charya Ramad class. That time in, 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 in India, Maharaj would practically even, every evening have a program. And many times the same devotees would come to the various programs. So one devotee I was there with recently, he told me he had gone for a program. So after that, after that program, you know, all the devotees would come to meet Maharaj. And all the Grahasthas Maharaj would hug them personally. So there was a couple who came for the first time. So then they saw that everybody standing in a queue. So there the, the Prabhu went and Maharaj hugged him. And the Mataji didn't know she had come for the first time. She also stepped forward. <laughs> <laughs> and Maharaj folded his hands. Mataji, I am not so advanced. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the point was I'm making is that Maharaj he gave a lot of association to those devotees and he trained them and eventually many of them became counsellors and those brahmacharis who trained and now they have become travelling preachers. So basically to create sustainability for the devote, devotees nourishment there is one spiritual master but a spiritual master creates a community of teachers. So there can be grahastha teachers, there can be uh, brahmachari teachers. And it is through the various Shiksha Gurus. Now this is just in our God family, but the same principle is now manifesting in different ways through different spiritual masters also. But in many ways, Maharaj was the pioneer in this. He said, let's stop temple, uh, temple construction. So Maharaj has built now a big, nice, beautiful community in Govardhan Eco Village. And Radha Gopinath Temple is also beautiful. But he did not focus on building a temple. He did not focus on too much on book distribution or fundraising. He focused on <coughs> devotee cultivation, on community building. And community building, what does it mean? It means that there can, there, a, there's a community only when there are multiple sources of inspiration. Otherwise, it's more like a personality-centered thing, which is also good in its own way, but it has its limitations. So if you go to the Radha Gopinath temple, you'll see the Vyasasana itself is, it's not exactly, it's not a chair, it's like a couch. Mm -hmm. you know? So the whole that, that symbolism itself indicates that it's not as one teacher. So he deliberately, most temple, no temple has like that. No, almost, I have not seen any other temple which has <coughs> A big Vyasasan, so that Sunday program and other programs, <coughs> the Maharaj has God brothers coming. So multiple speakers speak together. And we have this in our tradition also, Vandeham Shri Guru, Shri Uttapagadagam, Shri Gurun Vaishnavamsya. So Gurun is the various spiritual master. It's the plural. So we have one Guru, but we have many Gurus also. And Krishna also in the Bhagavad Gita in the uh, fourth chapter when he talks about this, Tad Tadviddhi Pranipatena Pariprashnena Sevaya Upadekshanti Te Gyanam 
Jnana Sattva Darshina. So it's interesting, Krishna uses the plural over there. Jnani is singular, Jnaniness is plural. So he says, go to the self-realized souls, learn from them. So for us, whichever Shiksha Guru we can get inspiration from, nowadays through the internet, there's a lot of illusion available, but a lot of devotion and knowledge also is available for us. So we take the responsibility to nourish ourselves. If we have that personal association, that is wonderful. If we don't have personal association, still we take the responsibility to nourish ourselves. So maturity means to recognize that no one is obliged to fulfill our need. Maturity means to recognize that no one is obliged to fulfill our need. It doesn't mean that our need will not be fulfilled. But no one is obliged to fulfill. Like a small baby, the baby feels hungry, baby starts crying. And the mother, the father, the caretaker who are there run and feed the baby. Now if an adult is hungry and starts crying, <laughs> now he'll say grow up. <laughs> now the adult's hunger is, is as much a serious need as is the child baby's hunger. But for the, the adult knows that nobody is obliged to fulfill my need. I have to take the responsibility. So similarly for us, to mature in Krishna consciousness means to recognize that no one is obliged to fulfill our need. But we take the responsibility to, uh, to find out how our need can be fulfilled. We find out how we can be best Krishna conscious, how we can be happy, and how we can cooperate with the local, uh, local authorities. Well, local authorities means <coughs> they are like the Shiksha Gurus we have. We work with them and thus we can flourish in our bhakti. So that's briefly what I wanted to speak. We'll have a few minutes for questions. I'll quickly summarize what I spoke. So I spoke on the theme of how we can learn to practice bhakti from the example of our spiritual master. So I talked about a bhakti there is submission, there is and there is inspiration. So it's submission to authority and it's personal inspiration both. So how Maharaj manifested that in his Govardhan Eco Village project. Prabhupada's dream was that there should be a like New Vrindavan, a place for Western people to come. But uh, somehow it didn't happen in New Vrindavan, West Virginia. So Maharaj is manifested it in Govardhan Eco Village. Simultaneously with that, by manifesting New Vrinda, manifesting Vrindavan over there, he's also, what he has done is, seen what is the need of today's time. So he said, we have to present Bhakti according to the need of the times. So, so when Prabhupada went to the West, it was just reject, the counterculture was there. It was reject everything. When we came to India, it was cultural nationalism. India is so great and even western people are following India. But now the mood is of <coughs> contribution. Okay, whatever your philosophy, whatever your practice, what difference does it make in the world today to us? So, to, so in my, uh, taking that with respect to environmentalism, the whole mood is to demonstrate how we can live eco-friendly by practicing bhakti. And <coughs> to, so there is this principle of submission to authority and there is the principle of individual initiative. So, of how we can practice bhakti. Prabhupada himself, he was told by his spiritual master to practice bhakti in the share, preach in the West. He did that, but then he spent a significant time on in India because that's where he felt he could have a sustainable structure for the practice of bhakti. So, now how does that apply for us in our lives? I talked about those three instructions. What are they? Be Krishna conscious. Be happy. Corporate local authorities. So. So I talked about the first two being that they chant Hare Krishna and be happy. They are both causal and parallel. It's like even if we can, we'll be happy when we are cured, but we can also be happy that we are, we have got the cure, even if we are not yet cured. And a significant part I focus on that, co cooperate with local authorities. This is not just a, a institutional necessity, but it is the traditional operating principle. I talked about her past where there are sannyasi gurus and there were grahastha priests. And the, along with the grahastha priests, even if the sannyasi gurus were there, the grahastha priests and the grahastha community and the, the community over there was the primary source of nourishment and sustenance for devotees. When Prabhupada's time, it was a historically anomalous thing. And I say Prabhupada emphasized the spiritual master very heavily, but he also talks about shiksha, he also talks about shiksha gurus in his books. <coughs> And I concluded the example of the PA, of a student doing PhD. The Diksha Guru is the like the HOD who gives admission to the university. But the Shiksha Gurus are like the specific specialists 
who are the phd guides who help the student to grow and for each one of us we have to find out, we have to take responsibility for our krishna consciousness for our spiritual growth maturity means to recognize that no one is obliged to fulfill our needs so but for fulfilling our needs maharaj in his own way he has created a community he was there but what was so we are moving towards the tradition where there is not just one diksha guru but there are many shiksha gurus and together with all of them we can practice our bhakti and flourish in bhakti thank you very much hare krishna any quick questions comments yeah so in the last example where you explained how diksha guru's value is like of a dean who approves Hmm. And that he is the one who connects us to the spiritual, like to the parampara. But then, in our case, as an Iskon, like we have Sri Prabhupada as well, and that's what we see in IDC that he is like treated as an yeah, Acharya, correct. and correct. we have many Diksha Gurus, and we are at different places, not in association of our own spiritual masters. So how, in our Krishna consciousness, attachment to our own spiritual master is important, and <coughs> and. How does that happen actually, and how do how do we fit in the whole scenario of? Hmm. Good question. So, how does attachment to the spiritual master uh, fit into our uh, movement right now? How do we, yes, I'll talk about it. See, there is a verse by Yoga Swami which says, who says that keep your mantra and your guru gopayet, keep it secret. So the idea over there is twofold. At one level, A B A S Gushuk Thri B One. We want to broadcast the glories of our spiritual master. But at another level, it is the relationship with the disciple and the spiritual master is a personal relationship. If we see Vishnu Chakra Thakur in his commentary, he just talks about obeisances, offering obeisances to spiritual master. But he has a whole twelve cantos of Bhagavatam commentary, but he doesn't mention his spiritual master by name very often. If I'm not mistaken, not even once he mentions directly hmm, who is spiritual. But he's off, he's grateful to spiritual master because see when Balde Vidya Bhushan, when he's writing his Govinda Bhashya commentary on the Vedanta Sutra, he doesn't mention Vishnu Chakravarti at all. Although Vishnu Chakravarti was such a great acharya, he doesn't even mention Jiva Goswami. Why? Because the Vedanta Sutra commentary is for the broad Indian body of scholars. And they are not going. They don't. They are not going to accept as authority the authorities of our tradition. So he, when he has to substantiate a point, he quotes from the Upanishads, from the Vedas, from the Bhagavad Gita, the Shruti and Smriti. So we have to. We may have great devotion to our spiritual master, particularly, but we have to present ourselves in a way that serves the purpose of furthering <coughs> our service. It serves the purpose of furthering our service. <coughs> so we see Baldev Vidya Bhushan in the Govind Bhashya commentary. Go pay it. He doesn't talk about his guru. Even his Gita commentary also is inspired by Bhakti Vishnu Chakravarti. But Vishnu Chakravarti has a commentary which is more rustic for devotees to relish. Baldev Vidya Bhushan has a more Tattva Gyan centered commentary, philosophical. Center. So he doesn't mention Vishnu Chakravarti over there. It's not. It's not required for that context. So we live in a community now. Where, as you rightly said, Prabhupada is the central acharya for us. So, we don't. For us, our guru is we not exactly gopayet. Then, since we hide the guru, but there is no need to broadcast uh, talk about our guru. We talk about Krishna. We talk about Shri Prabhupada. We talk about the process of Krishna bhakti, and connect people with that process of Krishna bhakti. How specifically they want to get connected further? That's that's up to them. So, in a sense, again. We are following what was in the tradition. See, we don't see Advaita Acharya telling everyone, "Oh, my guru is so great. All of you take inspiration from my guru." Doesn't do that, you know. He has his own guru, he has his inspiration, but he just he just practices bhakti and shares bhakti with others. As far as our personal <coughs> attachment to the spiritual master is concerned, generally attachment, if you see in general in the world, how does it develop? Mm. See, if uh, it's uh, it's multiple ways. One is if we just spend some time with someone, that is one way to develop attachment. Another way is that if we hear from them. So when we spend time with them, often the attachment that may develop may be material. Uh, but we, if we hear from them, there's a much deeper attachment that develops. So just by hearing from them, 
attachment can develop it can also develop by hearing about them from others so that's why a spiritual master has written books especially books about their personal life or personal journey spending some time reading that is also helpful associating with those who are inspired by the spiritual master those uh, that that also gives us inspiration so we don't have to worry too much if there is no uh, like a overflowing personal attachment to the spiritual master because that the whole point is there is emotionality and there is emotion or sentimentality and sentiment so once uh, i think shutakirti prabhu he was traveling with prabhu pada sir and he said that prabhu pada wherever i go devotees are welcoming you with ecstatic kirtans and they are crying tears seeing you and whenever you leave from that place devotees are crying tears uh, uh, but i am always with you and i have no tears <laughs> and prabhu pada just looked at him and prabhu said but you are serving me you are serving me so if there if tears come that's wonderful but the more important thing is not the tears come or not the more the more important is whether there is commitment in service or not so we could say that there is uh, we don't want to say somebody who has a lot of emotion uh, who has a lot of uh, emotional attachment is necessarily showy they could have deep attachment but the real test is commitment to service so if you just trying to do that we hear regularly and associate as much possible by that the attachment will develop it's not that we have to somehow imagine and do something artificial to develop that attachment uh, we we try to just commit ourselves to the process of bhakti the attachment to guru attachment to krishna attachment to vaishnavas all of it we don't have to we don't have to take one limb and over emphasize it we don't have to de emphasize it also but we don't have to over emphasize it also so we do the practice of bhakti and within that the attachment to guru krishna and vaishnavas all will develop Yes, yes, bro. Um, during disciples meeting, what uh, what do we have to focus on? What is our process that we follow when we come together as co-brothers? Mm. How often do you have it? We try at least once in two months. what can we do in sabbath meeting what do you currently do so we begin with uh, guru puja we sing a national college for guru maharaj we listen to his guru maharaj's lecture and then we discuss points from that and then it's a nice plan that's good that's you are focusing on the center on the special master's words that's very good if <clears throat> you have if some of you have had associated with some some senior devotees where you heard some personal experiences with maharaj you can share that also but what you are doing is good enough hmm? that's nice <clears throat> another thing which you could do to make it a little more sharing is that instead of hearing a lecture of maharaj together all of you can plan that you can hear something and then you all share one one point that will it will make it more it's not just hearing but it's all more all of you will also connect more and then you could also let me just try how it works so just a thought that that will make sure that the hearing of maharaj is not just at this time you also hearing at other times and not only just hearing but also noting down because sometimes we will not be exactly be able to share that at other, other forums we will share the point but we will not be able to share the source so but if you have that then you could not only speak the point but you can also speak what about that point inspired you so that way you can bodhayantah parasparam you know it's like <coughs> not just hearing vertically but you also hearing laterally and uh, since you're not a very big group so <coughs> it's possible that you could do that that would that might also help okay yeah uh, recently when we had uh, just a project of god temple of the Garashamu was that you can have it in the temple. I know that Guru Maharaj doesn't like uh, elaborate one. Uh, do we respectfully say no or do we go with the, the temple? <coughs> uh, 
I think a lot depends on <clears throat> the local temple's tradition. So, the local temple has a tradition of various spiritual masters, Vyasa Puja happening in the temple. Then our spiritual masters also happen, that's not a problem. So, what Maharaj's concern is that uh, that the temple where he is, for example, Radha Gopinath, that shouldn't become centered on him. In some ways it is, because it's mostly his disciples. But the temple is centered on, in terms of worship at least, is centered on Krishna and Srila Prabhupada. So that's why he doesn't have his Vyas Puja in the temple. But I'm not sure whether the, that principle will apply at other places. Because other places, again, there is no like, obviously he is not going to be the center of worship because there are many, many spiritual masters. So, Maharaj stays, Maharaj stays for a good amount of time in Chicago and from what I know, in Chicago, temple only they do the Vyas Puja of Maharaj. Although Maharaj is not there at that time. Like they have different, I am not sure about this, I can confirm this. But I would say in this case, there is no need to go against the tradition of the local temple. We don't emphasize, we don't, we don't impose on the local temple, but you don't have to also, local temple and, uh, sorry, that has to be, we don't have to also oppose. That would be my understanding. But I can find out more about how it is done in other places. So, if word goes out that we're doing a Vyasa Puja, it will actually end up being an elaborate offering. But do they do it for other Gurus also? Uh, they do it, but not always in the temple. Not always in the temple. You can just do what is convenient, you know, you have to look at a local, not convenient, uh, look at on what is, uh, what is most congenial. Say sometimes the temple authority may say a particular thing and just going along with that would be good. But sometimes the temple authority may say a certain thing, but the other people in the community may not be so happy with that and you don't want to ruffle feathers. So whatever works the best. Okay. Anything else? You about the three points. Can you check if Ganshan Prabhu has come? Then I will have to leave. Yeah. You mentioned about the three points being Krishna conscious, being happy. The second point about being happy. Hmm. So this person, of, of course, is happy. So it's good. But while one is on this path, begin with, one is faced with challenges. And it may not always be happy, like because you are, there will be ups and downs and all hmm. that. So uh, one has to just tolerate and just hope that Okay, this is going to lead to the bliss that you know it is talked about. So along the way, there will be challenges, there will be difficulties, there will be down periods. So that is to be expected, right? Yeah. So it's like, see, if you experience unhappiness, phases of unhappiness, that's that's just a part of life in the world. So when we say we have to be happy, it's uh, it's just the idea that we. We don't make happiness the main purpose of our life. I think, were you there for the retreat where I talked about happiness as a, happiness is not the product, but it's a byproduct. So if we are, so if we see that happiness is a byproduct, then we try as much as possible for happiness. But if it doesn't, uh, I mean, we not, we don't try to be unhappy. Obviously, we try to do the things which make us happy. But happiness is not our primary purpose. Our primary purpose is to be Krishna conscious. And while being Krishna conscious, so it's like we are on a journey. So if we have if both roads are equidistant, and one road goes to some beautiful area, so we can see enough night sights. One other road is it goes to some not so beautiful, maybe some ugly areas also, some nasty areas. You would prefer this road. But if this is the only road available, there is a road we have to go through, we will go through that, we will keep focusing on moving onward. So when it says be happy means that you don't have to choose necessarily the more difficult road. But as a Krishna, being Krishna consciousness is the first thing, being happy is not the first thing. So even sometimes, sometimes in distress, we may find it that uh, the intensity of our Krishna consciousness may increase. Because basically what does distress mean? See, all of us have some shelters in the world. 
as if right now <coughs> I tell you that an earthquake occurred in Japan. Okay, that's just one news. If you say, okay, the earthquake occurred in Melbourne. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. And we have some friends in Melbourne. Okay, if you say earthquake occurred in, a, in Sydney. Oh, which part of Sydney? Oh, we'll be more concerned. But if the earthquake occurs right under you, <laughs> huh? then you don't need a news report for it. You're actually <laughs> experiencing it. So basically, the closer the quake occurs to where we are grounded, that much more will be shaken. Mm -hmm. So for all of us, we, we want to be grounded in Krishna, but we are also grounded in various other things. We may be grounded in our wealth, our social status, our health, our so many other things like that. Mm. Now these are also groundings that are required in the world, but they are not the ultimate ground. So the, when some distress happens, that basically is like the ground near us or the ground under us is getting shaken. So when that happens, we can either get agitated and panicky or we can try to move toward the ground that will never shake. And Krishna is the ground which never shakes. So we could say that you know, we are anyway trying to move toward Krishna. All the various grounds that we have, say our family, our financial security, our health, our social relationships, all that. These are all meant to provide us, you could say transitional security. There is security in it, but it's transitional, it's not permanent. This transitional security is meant to take us toward Krishna. So they are like various bridges. But sometimes when those bridges start shaking or breaking, then either we can fall with it or we can accelerate moving from the bridge toward Krishna. And as you rightly said that it's not that these things will be permanently there. When we go to a dark phase in our life, it's, um, we, it's one, one good thing to do is to when we are going through unbearably bad times, decrease your working time to manageable units. Don't think in terms of one year or five years. Just think in terms of one day. Okay, I'm going through this difficulty. What will happen after this? What will happen after this? Suppose somebody loses a job, somebody gets a health issue. And so we think too much in the long term. It's just there are too many variables and unpredictables over there. If we try to figure them all out, we'll just go mad. So just focus on, divide, decrease the frame of reference. Okay, in this day to day, what can I do to not make things worse? At least that much. Or what can I do to make things better? So if I decrease the frame of reference, take one day, one day, one day. And gradually you'll find that the dark phase, it's not like a dungeon in which we are trapped. It is like a tunnel. And at the end of the tunnel, there will be light. Okay. Thank you. Yes, come. We have five minutes. He will be there. Okay, yes. Last question. Yes, last question. Yeah. So, Prabhu, you were saying how we should have many Siksha Gurus. But it says in the Shastras that the work or the instructions of the spiritual master should never be, like, we should never disobey them. So, when you have many Siksha Gurus, should you take all of their instructions like that? Or um, how should you approach them? Okay, good question. Mm hmm. If we have multiple Shiksha Gurus, then we also said we should never disobey the instructions of the Shiksha Guru. So, how, do, how does that work out? That's why generally, the Diksha Gurus won't give in direct instructions about practical details. They will give instructions and principles, like say, chant Hare Krishna, serve devotees, worship deities, whatever. Practical instructions, usually the Diksha Guru doesn't give. Of course, in specific situations, for specific items that, that Diksha Guru may give. But otherwise, even in, in Chokpati, in the early Radha Govinda community in the early days, Maharaj was giving the practical guidance, but thereafter he was focusing more on uh, letting the Grahastha community guide the Grahasthas and letting the senior brahmacharis guide the younger brahmacharis. So, yes, we don't, so in general, it is not that the spiritual master will give an instruction, the Diksha Gurus, Diksha Gurus will give other instructions. Rather, you could say, the Diksha Guru will give the broad direction of where to go and the Shiksha Gurus will help us clear the path. Okay, this is the direction you want to go, how can you go along this path? This path is easier, this path is not so practical, or you come, this obstacle on this path, you can remove it. So they are all working together. 
if there is a conflict then it's best that we defer to them only either ask the shiksha guru this is what i have heard from my diksha guru or if the diksha guru is accessible ask the diksha guru itself but generally uh, that kind of issue will not come okay. thank you shri prabhu pad ki shri radhanath maharaj ki gaur bhakt vrind ki tai gaur premanand जय yeah.